Resourceful Designer, episode 105, Coping with Isolation When Working from Home. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host. He made over $1,000 on eBay selling loot his character found in a computer game. Mark Decote. Well, thank you for tuning in this week. You know, it really does mean a lot to me that you've decided to spend a little bit of your week listening to what I have to say, and hopefully some of it will help you with your design business. Now, I had a really strange start to my week. On Monday, I received a call from a gentleman. He got my name from the Chamber of Commerce. He told me that he had just started a brand new drywall business, joined the Chamber of Commerce, and they told him that he needed to be on Facebook. So he went out and bought his very first computer and he had no idea what to do with it. So he got my name from them and he called me up to see if I could help him get onto Facebook. Now, first of all, I was a little taken aback by this, but then I asked him, well, what do you want to do with Facebook? And he says, I have no idea. You probably post some photos or something. He, he really didn't know what to do with it. He just knew that the Chamber of Commerce told him that he should be on Facebook. So I told this guy that I don't normally help people with Facebook. I design websites. And he replied, I have no idea what a website is. Do I need one? Again, I, I was just shaking my head at this. So I told him that while a website could definitely help your business, but if you want me to design one, it'll start somewhere around $2,000 depending on what you want. Well, at the other end of the phone, I just heard complete silence. I don't know if the, I just scared him away or what. So I, I told him, I says, well, I take it from your reaction that a website's not something that you had in your expenses right now. So why don't we just stick with Facebook? And then I asked him if he had any kids. And he said, yeah, he had two kids. Both of them are grown up and have families of their own. And I says, well, that's great. You know that your kids grew up in the Facebook era. He says, I'm sure they know all about it. Why don't you ask them if they can help you? Because if I do it, I'll have to charge you. And they'll probably be able to do it for free. Well, he thanked me to no end. He said, that's a great idea. He hadn't even considered his kids. It's just when the Chamber of Commerce gave him my name, said contact Mark. Well, anyways, he thanked me and we hung up. And I felt like, wow, did I ever dodge a bullet there? Um, not that. I mean, I understand Facebook. I've never helped the client set up Facebook for the first time. Every client that I've had Facebook, I've done work for Facebook for clients, but they've always been on it beforehand. So anyways, uh, that was a client I really didn't want to work with. And then on Tuesday, I, I thought that was pretty bad. But then on Tuesday, I get a phone call from another person, or potential client. He got my name from one of the services I use, one of the print shops. They They gave him my name. And he tells me that, He's starting a heating and cooling business, air conditioners and furnaces and that sort of stuff. And we start talking about, he says he's looking, he needs branding and all that. I says, okay, well, this is great. You know, it sounds good. And then he says, can you look up? He says, here's a, here's a search. Can you go into Google and do a search? And he tells me what to search for. And then he says, look at the images. And he says, do you see the images that come up for such and such a company? And I says, oh yeah, I see that. It's, they've got like a little, it's a, a cartoony superhero guy that has fire coming out of one hand and, and ice coming out of the other hand. And I said, oh, okay, that's kind of cute. And he had mentioned a character. So I says, oh, so you want some sort of character that's doing something similar to that? And he tells me, he says, no, he says, I really like that one. Can you just take that one and use it for my uh, logo? I said, no, I can't. There, there's copyright infringements and trademark infringements involved. And I says, I can't do that. And he says, well, what's wrong? People take stuff from the internet all the time. I'm not worried about it. He says, besides, that company's at the other side of the country. He'll never know that I'm using it. Then he tells me that not only does he want to use the guy's logo, he likes the company name, and he was thinking of registering this exact same name here in Ontario because he thought, well, the company name kind of goes with the little caricature that the, the guy had made, and he says, I'm just going to do the whole thing. And I, I immediately told him, I says, well, I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that. And he says, oh, don't, don't worry. He says, if you're afraid that you might get caught or something, I just won't tell anybody that you did it for me. And I was just so shocked. I, I was almost speechless. And finally, I told him, I says, listen, that's not the issue that you wouldn't tell. I would know I had done something. I wouldn't want you to steal something that I designed for one of my clients. Well, I'm not about to do that for another designer. 
And I told him, I says, you do what you want to do, but I don't want anything to do with it. And that was the end of the conversation. So that was the beginning of my week this week. Two different clients, two different situations, both of them definitely didn't want to work with. But if you've been in this business long enough, you get to see all of it. Anyway, now I'd like to share my resource of the week. Now, this is a resource that was shared with me by Sean from the Facebook group, both a listener of the podcast and a prominent member in the Facebook group. And this is a website called FontReach at FontReach.com. Now, this is a kind of more just a little fun resource. What FontReach does is it looks at the top million websites. Now, I don't know how it's getting this list, but uh, obviously on Google, but it says it, it searches the top 1 million websites and it can tell you how popular certain fonts are across those websites. So you can either do a search for whatever font you want, and it'll tell you how many of the top million websites are using that font. As, or you can actually look, they have a list of the top fonts used on the top million websites. As an example, Arial is the number one font. And according to the list that I looked at today, it's used on 604,158 websites. Second place is Helvetica New, 281,150 websites. All the way down the list to fonts like Kaluna San and Fugaz One, which are on only 86 websites out of the top 1 million. So this is kind of more of just a fun resource. If you're looking through Google fonts for your next web project and you're trying to figure out what fonts to use, you can go look at this one just to see how popular certain fonts are and maybe use one that chances are nobody has seen before because it's not used on a whole lot of websites. So thank you, Sean, for sharing that with me. It's a fun little resource. Don't know how much use we'll get out of it, but it's just something fun to have a look at. And that's at fontreach.com. And now, coping with isolation when working from home. Now, I want to state right off the top here that I am not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. The, the things I'm about to discuss are my opinions and my opinions alone. If you think that you may be suffering from any sort of loneliness or depression, please seek professional help. Thank you. Now, the reason I wanted to discuss this topic is because isolation is actually one of the major concerns when running your own home-based design business. Working from home is not for everyone. Whenever I tell anyone that I run a home-based business, that I work from home, I get usually one of two responses. Some people will reply saying, oh, you're so lucky, I wish I could do that. And other people will say, I don't know how you can do that. Being by yourself all the time, it would drive me crazy. Very rarely will I get somebody that's kind of in the middle. It's either one extreme or the other. And the type of person you are will determine if running your own home-based design business is for you. Maybe you're thinking of starting a business. Well, this is a major thing that you should be thinking. Are you able to work by yourself day in, day out, day after day, week after week, month after month, and be okay with it? There's some people that just can't handle that. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's something you have to know before you just decide to take on this solopreneur or uh, even though I don't like the term, the freelance life. Be aware of that before you jump in. And the thing is, some people can actually do this long term like I can and others can only handle it for a short while or maybe even a long while, but eventually it gets to them. I know a local designer here that started off, I remember him when he was working for another guy. He was an employee of another guy. They had a, a little studio together and he was really getting a name for himself. And he eventually left and started his own business. And he ran his business for, I'm sure it was over 10 years because I remember him celebrating his 10th anniversary of his business. And then all of a sudden one day, my wife comes home from work and says, oh, you know so-and-so? Well, they just got hired where I work, where my wife works. She says, they, he just got hired to uh, in the design department there. He's going to be running, helping to run the design department. And I thought, wow, this guy, like this, at this point, I was running my own business. And all of a sudden, and, and he was a peer, a quote-unquote competitor. And all of a sudden, he closed up his business and went to work for the company my wife, where my wife works. Now, when I met him shortly after that and I asked him about it, he told me that it just got to him. He said he'd been doing it for just over 10 years and eventually it just got to the point where he wasn't motivated 
He was spending a lot of time doing other stuff at home. He didn't really want to get in front of the computer anymore. He didn't find the motivation. And he was taking longer and longer to get back to clients. Clients would ask him for stuff. He was missing deadlines. And he says he just wasn't into it anymore. And he he said a lot of it had to do with just being alone. He, He felt a little depressed. And he and his wife discussed it. And he decided to get a job. And he told me afterwards, and this was a few years ago. And when I talked to him recently, he said it was one of the best decisions he ever made says he doesn't regret running his own business, but it it got to him to the point where he couldn't do it anymore. And now he says he wouldn't go back to doing that. So some people like this was over 10 years that he did it. And then he decided that it was just too much. He was getting depressed. So it just goes to show that even if you think you can handle it, maybe there comes a point where you can't anymore. Now, I've been doing this now for going on 13 years and I'm still going strong and I still I cannot imagine myself going back to work for somebody else. But everybody is their own individual and has their own feelings towards this. I'm the type of person that can handle it. Now, it was easier at the beginning when I had my kids at home. They would be home during the summer. So I had somebody to talk to and my kids would get home after school and I could talk to them, get their snacks ready. And it was somebody to interact with. So I wasn't as isolated. Now my kids are are off to post-secondary. They don't live nearby. They, They live in another city. And there are weeks that'll go by where I might go three, four days in a row without seeing a single person other than my wife. Now, I'm lucky that I'm married and I have my wife coming home to me. Maybe you don't have that. Maybe you're not married. Maybe you live by yourself. And that is a completely different situation where you live alone. And if you're working alone, that could really take its toll on you. Because to live a healthy and fulfilling life, you need close and interpersonal relationships with people. So this is a big factor when deciding to run a home-based business is whether or not you can cope with the isolation of being by yourself every day. Now, I want to share some of the things you can do to help with that if it is an issue or even if it isn't an issue. Like in my case, I love being alone. I could spend days by myself without seeing anybody and it doesn't affect me, or at least I don't believe it affects me. That doesn't mean I don't like interacting with people or going out to meet people. But if I didn't, it wouldn't be that big a deal. Maybe if it was weeks or weeks without seeing anybody, I might get to me. But I can go a few days, no problem. But that doesn't mean that I don't take some steps in order to help me deal with isolation anyways. So the first thing I want to talk about is just your work environment. If you are going to be working in this place day after day, week after week, you have to create a happy and inviting work environment, some place that you like sitting down, some place that you like going to. If you are just working at your kitchen table, that can only go on for so long. I highly suggest you get yourself an office, some place that you can call your workspace, that that's all it is, is workspace. You don't want to share the place with anybody else in the household. Now, that's not always possible. But whenever it is, or if you can, even if it's just a corner of a room that you stick a table in and you can have your laptop there, and that's your place, create a happy environment. And when you're working, when you're all by yourself, maybe have some stuff just to help make it a happy environment. Play some music. Some designers love listening to music as they work. I'm not one of them. I can't have music on while I'm working. Sometimes, depending on what I'm doing, I might put some stuff on, but I could say I probably listen to music while working maybe once every two or three months. But some people have to have either a radio or just music playing. And if that's you, then make sure you do that. It creates a good environment for you to work. Maybe music is not your thing, but you want some sort of soothing sounds. Maybe you have one of those small desktop waterfalls, little thing that you turn on and it just has water cascading over rocks and it creates that little sound. Or you can actually have a sound machine that can create sounds of nature, sounds of waves, sounds of of rain, whatever. Some people need that. They can't work in silence. And if that's you, get one of those things to help you. Just having a happy environment will be less inclined to create that sense of isolation. Another thing you can do is just have nice stuff in your office. Photos on the walls. If you if you are somebody who likes the outdoors, well, maybe have some nice photos of outdoors. If you want, you can have photos of family and, and friends and stuff, photos of people you can look at whenever you're, you're just sitting there at your desk. 
or just doesn't have to be photos. It could be anything that makes you happy. I look around my office and I've got a shelf here with all sorts of geeky stuff. I have stuff from the Lord of the Rings movies. I've got a TARDIS from Doctor Who. I've got a little Batman figurine. I've got a hockey puck from my Toronto Maple Leafs and a whole bunch of other stuff. Not to mention all my books. I've got some books there from design, but I've got other types of books there. And it's just stuff I could look at and makes me feel good, makes me feel happy being in this environment. Now, another thing about your environment is make sure you have good lighting. It's amazing how good lighting can really improve a workspace. If you've got good lights, then chances are you're going to feel better about working there. Best if you can have a window nearby. I've got a huge window next to me here, and it creates a lot of natural light in here that just livens the place up. Now, of course, that doesn't work during the winter months when it gets dark really early or if I'm working late, which I tend not to do. I try not to work late, but sometimes you have to. But just try to have good lighting in your office. Because if you like your working environment, chances are you'll feel less isolated when you spend time in it. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is when you're feeling lonely or isolated, or you you just feel like you need to be around people, get out. Go for a walk in a park. Go for a walk at a shopping mall. You don't have to actually interact with people. But just being around people, even without interacting with them, will help alleviate some of those feelings of isolation. I'm a people watcher myself. I love going to the mall and just looking around and watching people. It makes me feel good. I don't have to talk to them. Now, I'm the type of person that I've got no problems walking up to a stranger and starting a conversation, but I don't have to do that every single time. I can just be around people, watch people go about their day, and it just makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm in the community. Now, just on another note, just getting out there, going for a walk in a park or in the mall, just going out and being around people, it's a great way to get over a creative slump. Or if you're having a problem with something, a design element or that, just changing your environment can often help you get over that hurdle. So if you're being frustrated by whatever, you're working on something for a client and things just aren't going well, you're not feeling it, get out, go buy something at the mall, go do your groceries. So the great thing about working from home is if you take an hour out now to go to the grocery store, walk around, be around people, when you come back, you can get back to work. If you want, you can take that hour that you went to do groceries and put that hour in during the evening or whatever. It's one of the perks of working from home. You can control your own hours. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is kind of along the same lines as just getting out. And that's if you just feel like the isolation is getting to you, move your workspace. Go work at a coffee shop, someplace where they have Wi-Fi or someplace that uh, anywhere you can sit down and do some work. Now, obviously, you need a laptop for this. It wouldn't work for me. I've got an iMac that I use. I'm not going to pick up my iMac and bring it over to a coffee shop. But a lot of people work on on tablets or on uh, laptops, and they can easily pick up and go to a coffee shop, sit there for a bit, or pay for a shared workspace. A lot of cities now are coming up with these shared workspaces, either a place that you have a permanent desk that you're paying. It's almost like you pay rent for a desk somewhere. And there's other people that are at other desks doing their own business, but you just feel like you're around people. Even if you don't talk, just the fact that you're there, maybe it's just a matter of saying hi to somebody as you walk in or, or, you know, talking a little bit when you go up to get coffee or something. But a shared workspace might be an opportunity for you. Even if you only go there once a week, you can do four or five days a week at home, and then one day a week, go to this workspace. Now, there are some workspaces that is just you walk in, you pay by the hour or two hours, and you grab whatever desk is empty. And there are others where you have a designated spot and you have it reserved at a certain time. And other times of the week, other people might be using it. But they're a great way to just get out and interact with people. Because even if you're not talking with them, just being around other people can have a therapeutic effect on you. Now, speaking of being around people, that's the next thing I want to talk about. Be part of a community. Now, when I say be part of a community, that could mean just about anything. Do you have any hobbies or any sports you like to play? Well, join a group. It doesn't have to be competitive. It's just fun and something that you can interact with people. Do you remember playing badminton back in high school? Well, why don't you go to your local community center and see if they have a recreational badminton league? Maybe they have some squash ball courts around, or who knows, join a a basketball league or a soccer or football, depending on what part of the world you're in. Maybe it's just a group that gets together and plays cards. 
I know my local community has a certain night where anybody can go and they have board games to play. Become a part of this sort of thing. Not only is it great to get out and interact with people, but you could be making new friends, people that you can do other stuff with as well. So join these groups, find stuff, get out of the house and interact with people. Now, not just people, but try to interact with friends on a regular basis. Sometimes work can just get the best of you and friends want to do stuff and you're saying, oh, I can't, I've got a deadline or I've got this to work on. Well, you know what? Take some time, go out with friends. I've got two of my buddies. These are guys going back to my high school days. In fact, these are two of the guys that used to be a group of us that we, we played Dungeons and Dragons every week. Every Wednesday was Dungeons and Dragons nights. When we had our girlfriends, they knew that Wednesday nights was boys night. When we were engaged, when we got married, when we had kids, we played Dungeons and Dragons starting in high school until I would say I was in my late 30s, early 40s before we finally stopped playing but we didn't stop getting together. Now, we're not getting together as often now that everybody has families. I was the first one out of the group that had kids, so my kids are grown up, but the other people, they have still have young enough kids. But this group of guys, we still make a point that once a month, it's no longer once a week, but once a month, the first Wednesday of every month, no matter what we're doing, we get together for lunch. We'll pick a different restaurant around town and we'll meet there. And every time it's a different person that picks up the bills. So uh, it goes around. And so every so often, every few months, I have to pay the tab for wherever we are. But it's a great way to get together, just talk. It's only an hour, but it helps me. But there are days where I can't really afford to take the time. I've got a deadline or I've got a lot of stuff on my plate to do, but it's a commitment we made and I am grateful for it. So even if I think I don't have the time to do it, I make the time, I get out there, I have lunch with my buddies, and then I come back and get back to work. And I feel invigorated, I feel refreshed, I got to interact with people, and it helps with that feeling of isolation. So interact with friends whenever you can, whether it's during the day, in the evening, on weekends, as much as possible, try to interact with your friends. Now, sometimes that's not always possible at different times, and that's where stuff like social media comes in. You know, people say that social media is, could be either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. Some people get addicted to it or, or it's a big distraction. But for people that work at home, that are alone and isolated, social media can often be the escape they need. Join groups of people that you can get to know. The Resourceful Designer Facebook group is a great place. It's a great community with lots of people. We're getting to know each other. We talk and we discuss things. We joke around. We ask others' opinions. It's the type of place that I go to when I want to interact with people on a whim. If I'm in the middle of doing something and it's just I'm getting frustrated, I'll launch up Facebook to see what sort of communications or what sort of topics are being discussed in the Facebook group. I'll pipe in, give an answer here or there, and then once I feel good about that, I'll close it and get back to work. So that sort of thing is a great way to deal with isolation. Now, if you're not already a member of the Resourceful Designer Facebook group, you can join by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash group. Now, be sure to answer the questions. I have got to the point now where if people are not answering the questions, I'm just not letting them in. I used to look at their profile to see whether or not they were in the design space and so forth. And if they were, I would let them in even if they hadn't answered the question. But that was just taking too much time sometimes. So it's at the point now that if if you don't answer the questions and everybody that asks to join, the questions pop up for you to answer. If you don't answer, you're not getting in. So just answer the questions honestly, and I'll let you in the group. Now, another thing that has really helped me is I formed a mastermind group. Now, if you don't know what this term means, a mastermind group is a group of peers, a small group of peers that meet on a regular basis to discuss work, life, whatever. And it's also a, an accountability group. So if you have goals that you're setting for yourself, it's something that it's one thing to say, I have a goal, I want to do something. But when you share that goal with other people and they're encouraging you and keeping track of you, it makes you much more inclined to reach that goal. And the best thing about a mastermind group, at least in my group, is that whatever is brought up in the mastermind group stays in the mastermind group, which means we can say all sorts of stuff that we wouldn't really discuss out in the open with other people because we trust each other and we know that 
anything we talk about, whether it's good or bad, unless we are specifically told can be talked about, is not talked about. It's all told in confidence. So Mastermind Group, I've been in one that's been formed now for three, four, four years, maybe. Eh, maybe it's just three years. It feels like forever. These people have become my friends and I meet them every second week. Every second Tuesday, we meet for about an hour and a half, discuss a few things that have happened since our last meeting. And then everybody, every week, it's one person from the group. We're seven people in the group. Every week, one person from the group has the hot seat where it's their turn to discuss, ask questions. It's, it's their floor. We're there to help that person that week. And any issues they have, anything they want to talk about, any uh, thing they want to share with the group, if they found some amazing whatever that they want to share with the group, it's their floor. They have the podium to talk. And we do this all via Skype. And this has been wonderful for the past few years. I've been in this group and it has been so helpful for my business, for the podcast, for everything. So if you are not part of a mastermind group, I suggest you go out and find one or if not form one yourself. Now you can form one with other designers or just other business people. There's some groups that have people from all different industries. And then there's some mastermind groups that are formed from people within a certain niche, whatever you decide it will be beneficial. Because sometimes whenever you're feeling isolated, all it takes to get over that feeling is to share your life and experiences with people. And you could do that through, as I said, friends, social media, a mastermind group, whoever you want to share with. It'll help you feel less isolated. It's one of the reasons why I open every podcast episode with a few little comments about how my week has been. I like telling you those stories because you are part of my community. And it's my way to feel involved in your life. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, and this one isn't for everybody, but a great way to feel less isolated is to get a companion. I live in the house here during the day with two dogs and a cat. Now, I can't say for sure, but I believe that my dog, Lacey, is a great graphic designer. Why do I say that? Because of all the design-related conversations I've had with her over the years. I mean, she's sure to have picked up some tips over all of those conversations. No, but seriously, having a pet in your house is a great way to feel less isolated. Pets are someone that you can talk to. And what's great is you can physically see them paying attention to you. I mean, dogs are great for this. They hang on to your every word. My cat, on the other hand, hmm... Sometimes she'll listen to me, but most of the time she'll just give me a look of, stop talking, you're bothering me. Or she'll give me a look of, okay, that's enough talking about you, now pay some attention to me. So cats can help, but not always. But dogs, on the other hand, they're always there to lend an ear if you need to talk about anything. And just the fact that they're paying attention to you and you can reach down and pet them, it just makes you feel like you're not alone. And that really, really helps with the whole isolation thing. Now, maybe you're in a situation where a dog or a cat is not an option for you. Maybe you're allergic to them, or maybe you live in a place that doesn't allow that sort of pet. Well, how about something else? How about a fish? When I first started my business, that was one of the first things I did is I bought a fish. I had an aquarium on my desk here, and I bought one of those Japanese fighting fish. I think they're called bettas. It was a beautiful blue and and violet colored And uh, normally you see a lot of people, they have them in these little bowls. Well, I thought that was a little mean to live in a little bowl. So I bought a a bigger aquarium for him and I had him for, oh, I don't know, a year and a half, two years before he died. And it was just somebody I would look at him and, you know, it just made me feel good. I mean, I wouldn't really talk to him or anything like that, but I would give him food and he was seemed appreciative of it. And it was just sharing my space with somebody else. I mean, it's amazing how having another living being, whether it's a dog, a cat, or even a fish or whatever, maybe you like spiders or or mice or hamsters or whatever, it doesn't matter. But even just sharing your space with another living being can have a real effect on you. Sure, they can't have conversations with you, but they will make you feel less alone, less isolated. And the last thing I want to talk about is simply talking to yourself. Okay, you may be saying right now, okay, Mark, I think you're losing it, but bear with me here. Maybe you've heard before how talking to yourself is a sign that you're going crazy. Well, I don't believe that. I think 
talking to yourself is a sign that you are a highly creative person. Think about it. Who better to discuss your design and business issues with than yourself? I mean, you know your business and you're, you know your design capabilities better than anybody else. Now, if you're shaking your head at this idea, here's another thought. Instead of simply talking to yourself, stick a microphone in front of your mouth and call it podcasting. <laughs> no, seriously. Now, I'm no expert and I may be way off on this, but the way I see it, when you think about something inside your head, you're trying to go through a problem and you're, you're having this, I don't know, conversation with yourself inside your head, there's a certain part of your brain that's working on that problem. However, when you say the exact same things out loud, not only is that part of your brain working, but the parts of your brain that interpret sound is also working. And as far as I'm concerned, that means that more of your brain is working on the problem. And that's a good thing. Now, I could be completely wrong about this. And if I am, please do not tell me. Because this method has worked for me so many times in the past. Whenever I've been stuck on something and I, I just couldn't work it through, I'd start talking out loud. I'd be looking at something in maybe Adobe Illustrator and I'll say, okay, Mark, what's wrong with this logo? You know, there's something about it that just doesn't seem right. Hmm. Is it the color? No. Maybe it's the font. Maybe something has to be done. I don't like the way that, that T at the end is. Maybe if I adjust the serif just a little bit. Hmm. Let's try this. There. That's it. Oh, that's so much better. Good job. Just a stupid little conversation like that. Sometimes just talking out loud is all you need in order to get over a hump, to feel better. And there are far worse things that you can be doing when you're feeling isolated than having a conversation with yourself. Now, I will tell you this, though. If you do talk to yourself and your conversations start turning into arguments, then maybe you should seek some help. Now, as an added benefit, if you do have dogs in the house, as far as they're concerned, if you're talking out loud, you're talking to them, and they will definitely come over and pay attention to you. I can tell you that almost every issue of the podcast that I've recorded, I've had one or both of my dogs next to me at some point wondering, who's he talking to? Especially when I don't make eye contact with them. But I'll often put my hand down as I'm talking to you, and I'll be petting one of my dogs just to make them feel better. And I'm sure anybody out there, if you have a dog, then you can relate. So those are just some of the things I wanted to talk about today for dealing with isolation. Now, there are a lot of different things you can do. And as I mentioned at the beginning, if it's not just dealing with isolation, if you are feeling lonely or you feel depressed because of you being alone, please seek some professional help. Go see a therapist. Go ask your doctor for some help because that could be a much more serious issue. But if it's just the fact that, you know, you're, you're working by yourself and, you know, it's, I wish there was somebody else around, then do some of these things. Create a happier environment for yourself. Get out, go to a mall, go to a park, move your workspace to a coffee shop or a shared workspace, become part of a community, interact with friends, go join a sports team, even a recreational league that plays board games, interact with people on social media, join a mastermind group. For those times when you can't get out, if you can have a companion at home, a dog, a cat, any, anything, just something alive with you can help you. Even a plant. I know some people just love having plants around. I'm not a person with a green thumb, but my wife, I know that her desk at work is covered in plants. She loves her plants. It makes her feel good. It makes her appreciate her workspace more. Well, if that's you, then have plants on your desk around your office. It'll help you out. And lastly, as a last resort, just talk to yourself. Just the fact of talking out loud will make you feel a little bit better, feel like you're talking with someone, even though it is yourself. I know some people say, well, it really makes me feel crazy. But if you're a really creative person, which I know you are, you shouldn't have a problem talking to yourself. Anyway, that's the topic I wanted to cover today. Now, I would love to know what you do to cope with isolation. Please leave me a comment at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 105. And now this week's question of the week. This week's question comes in from Shania. Now, Shania actually sent in two questions. So I'm going to answer one of them this episode, and I'm going to save one for possibly next episode or maybe in a couple of weeks, depending on all the other questions I get in. But this is Shania's first question. She says, hi, Mark. I'm listening to episode 93 about targeting a design niche, and you hit on a problem that I've been struggling with, having a main business and then a separate brand for a niche. 
I've been struggling back and forth with the idea of using my own name for a business name that I already have picked out. I would like to keep it personal with my local clients, but I also have my own designs and plans of printed materials that I would rather have a business name attached to for marketing purposes and also for privacy. Should I do both or just pick a route and stick with it? How would you recommend setting up banking and such for these different brands to keep it less confusing? Thanks. Well, thanks for the question, Shanae. Now, I'm in the exact same situation as you. Not that I'm confused, but I have multiple brands. There are some things I do that I do under Mark Decote. There are some things I do under Resourceful Designer. There are other things I do that are under my business name. And the way I have it set up is I have my business name is the one that's registered. That's the the bulk of my earning. My graphic design business is where I make almost all of my income, most of my income. And it's the one that's registered with the government. It's the one that's registered at the bank. It's the one at the end of the year when I get my accountant to do my taxes. It's, that's the, the name it's under. Now, I have other stuff that I do that's just under my own name. And I have other stuff such as Resourceful Designer. I make money off Resourceful Designer when I have affiliate links that I'll share and, and I'll promote something and say, you know, maybe here's a product you might be interested in. Well, sometimes when people buy those products, I make a small commission off of it. It's not a whole lot of money, but it's enough to help cover the cost of the podcast and all that. Well, that's all done through Resourceful Designer. I also have another podcasting network called Solo Talk Media, where I do TV show podcasts at that one. And I make a little bit of money off that from people buying, I don't know, they go to Amazon to buy the DVD of the TV show, and I make a commission off that. Well, all these different things are under different names, but everything is routed through my main business. And what I do is all these other things, Resourceful Designer, Solo Talk Media, and whatever else. There are some other ones that I'm doing as well. I, ha- I do t-shirts and I ha- sell my t-shirts under a different name as well for the same reason as you, for privacy and marketing. And who knows, sometimes I might design a t-shirt and I don't know, not that I'm trying to, but maybe the design or the saying I put on the front of a t-shirt, some people might find it controversial. Well, I don't want that coming back to affect my design business. So I design my t-shirts under a different name as well. But all of these things, as I said, are routed through my main business. All these businesses, these other ones, are all, the way uh, the way the accountant puts it, is doing work as. So it's my main business doing work as Resourceful Designer or my main business doing work as Solo Talk Media. So any income that I make through these other quote-unquote businesses, everything gets routed through my main business. Now, to make that easier, what I normally do is when I set up stuff like my Amazon account or affiliates with anything else or anywhere else that I might be making an income, I usually just put it under my own name. It makes it easier, regardless of what I set up. Like if I set up a shop somewhere and uh, the shop is such and such a name, like who knows, like say I called it resourceful t-shirts. That's not what my business is, but say I call it resourceful t-shirts. Well, resourceful t-shirts might be the name of the business, but any payments or anything that come through would come through Mark Decote. Now, I do have at my bank, my bank account is under my main business name. And my bank account, they know I've had a, on my file that if I get a check under my business name, under my personal name, under Resourceful Designer, under Solo Talk Media, or any of these other ones, I've let my bank know that all these other names are all part of my main business. So if somebody writes me a check for some reason to Resourceful Designer, I can still go to my bank and cash it even though I don't have a bank account under Resourceful Designer. It's all tied in to my main business. The same thing with my accounting. If I get payments through Resourceful Designer, as far as my accountant is concerned, that's the same thing as paying my main business. So what I suggest to you is exactly what I've done. Do whatever you want. If you have a niche that you want to target, but you also want to do design for other stuff, there's nothing wrong with having a separate brand for that niche. There are so many people out there that have a whole bunch of different brands depending on what they're targeting. And you can create a brand specifically targeting a certain niche. And then you can have a different brand targeting a different one if you want. I believe I even talked about that in episode 93 about a niche. Or maybe it was back in episode 54, should you find a graphic design niche, where I actually talked about how it's okay to have your maybe your main business if you want to have your main graphic design business, and then maybe have a side business targeting that niche. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Now, of course, doing that does create a little bit more work for you as far as marketing and stuff like that, because you're going to have to market one business and then you're going to have to market the other business. But there's nothing wrong with using the same marketing material, just changing the branding on it 
I mean, most of the information will be the same. You might have to target something if it's a, a special niche, like say you're going after, I don't know, people who ride motorcycles, you might want to target a little bit of the copy on it to that. And then your other business that might be targeting florists, you're going to have to do the copy for florists, but a lot of the information on it will be the same. So once you design one marketing piece for one niche, it's easier to do the others for the others. So that's the way I would do it. Either register your business name, uh, a main name, and then all the others would be working as. Now, it's up to you whether you want to register all these other names. I have some that I have registered, some that I haven't, but all it is is a business name that's been registered. The actual business that I'm running under is my main design business. Everything else is a working as. And I've been doing this for 13 years now, and I don't find it confusing at all. You, that was one of the things in your question that you you were a little bit worried about finding it confusing. I personally don't. I know if I'm working on Resourceful Designer that that's the the business I'm working on. If I'm doing Solo Talk Media, that's the business I'm working on. If I'm doing T-shirts, then that's the business I'm working on. And when the money comes in, the money's all the same color, so it doesn't make a difference. It all ends up going into the exact same bank account. So hopefully, I answered your question there, Shanai. If not, send me another email and we can touch up on that a little bit more. Now, if you have a question you'd like me to answer on a future episode of the podcast, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback, submit your question there, and I will consider answering it on a future episode. Now, I'd like to share another beautiful iTunes review I received. This one came in from JoyJoe1112 from the USA. It says, must have for all designers. I had been feeling stuck in my design skills for a while and started a plan to plug myself and refresh. Finding a podcast to subscribe to was one of my goals to finding motivation and inspiration. I listened to a few of the other graphic design podcasts available, and to me, they were boring and did not deliver what was described, and I find myself fast-forwarding through a lot of the non-design content they talked about. From the moment I listened to Resourceful Designer, I was hooked. I started listening from the very first episode, and I've worked myself up to episode 52, and in the last few days, decided to listen to the newly released episodes to stay up to date. It has been a game changer and has provided so much inspiration and motivation in my design career. Thanks, Mark, and keep the good content coming. Well, thank you very much for that lovely review. I love receiving these things, just seeing what people think of the podcast. And it does help people when they're looking through iTunes or through Apple Podcasts, as they're called now. They don't like you to call it iTunes anymore. But when people are looking through Apple Podcasts, and they come across the, the different podcasts in there. Sometimes they might read through the reviews and decide, oh, this sounds like a good one to check out. So I do appreciate these reviews from whatever country. When I checked, I've had reviews in, I think, 12 different countries now so far. And I think that's amazing. Now, if you'd like to leave a review, you can go to resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes. I know the link says iTunes. It should say Apple Podcasts, but it's still slash iTunes. And that'll redirect you to my Resourceful Designer page on iTunes in whatever country your iTunes store is in. And you can leave a review there. And I have a handy little service called My Podcast Reviews that will notify me no matter what country the review is left in. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you leave a review, I will see it because of my podcast reviews, which will forward me that review. So thank you to JoyJo1112 and to everybody else who's ever left a review in iTunes for me. So that's it for this week. And before I go, I just want to remind you of the resource of the week that Sean shared, and that is fontreach.com, a fun little site just to see how popular certain fonts are across the top 1 million websites on the internet. So that's it for me. Until next time, I do wish you all the best with your graphic design business. And as always, remind you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.